Right, here we go. Richie, episode two, Searching for Shinies. We've found another player from the 1997 Merlin Premier League sticker book. We have Wonders Will Never Cease. Uh, but first, let's have a quick look back at, at last week's episode. Nottingham Forest legend Steve Chettle. And he, he proved to be a legend as well. What a lovely fellow. Yeah, agreed. He was a top man. And we got Cluffy stories. And we got Gaza stories. And we got a tale of him rescuing a dog from the trend. So we, we can't ask much more than that. No, I was hoping to hear a bit about Pierre Van Hoydonk and he delivered on that front as well. So, um, yeah, I'm really chuffed to have had him on the show. And um, if you haven't already listened to that show, please do go back and listen to episode one with Steve Chettle because, um, yeah, it's a, it was a great start for us. I'm contributing with a find this week. The clue is in the name, Searching for Shinies. We've been searching low and high and we found Lee Dixon, mm. which is, you know, unbelievable. A-lister, 1990s royalty, basically. Yes, explain to me how... I mean, Steve Chettle was fairly straightforward. I went on Twitter and sent him a message. But you finding Lee Dixon a bit more tricky. Yeah, well, a bit of luck, really. uh, Because I'm such a man about town living down here in London. My pal, Bobby, the oyster chef at the Chilton Firehouse, he mentioned that sometimes Lee Dixon gets in and he gives them oysters. Of course And I forgot about that. And then I remembered and I went, Bobby, do you fancy giving Lee Dixon a shout and seeing if he fancies coming on the podcast? And he went, yeah, no problem. Lee Dixon's That's email arrives, real. pinged him an email, and he said, yeah, sounds like fun, I'm in. That's a joke, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> honestly. Um, well, anyway, he, he was what a great guest as well. Yeah, unbelievable. I knew it was going to be a good episode from the Martin Keown story that he gave us within about <laughs> the first 10 minutes, which is just brilliant. And he even produced the 1989 Arsenal away shirt that he wore at Anfield, still has bits of Anfield on the back. He yeah. produced that. And put it on. So, yeah, can't believe it. Yeah. Well, listen, no more wittering. Let's listen to Lee Dixon. Hello, and welcome to Searching for Shinies, the football sticker book podcast. I'm Ketch, and with me is co host Richie Wyatt. Today, we have tracked down a genuine A lister from the 1997 Premier League sticker album. He appeared on page four of the book, sticker number nine. He made 635 career appearances and won 22 England caps. Across a 20-year career, he won four league titles, three FA Cups and the European Cup Winners' Cup medal. It's an honour to extend a big, shiny welcome to Arsenal's Lee Dixon. Lee, welcome to the show. How are you doing, guys? I'm so pleased I'm on page four and sticker number nine. I really <laughs> feel very honoured. I don't think we'll get a lower sticker in our, in our search, to be honest. So it's, it's, it's a big one for us. I don't, really, I don't know whether it's low good then. Well, I think... It's like when, at the start of the season, Arsenal are top of the league on alphabetical order. You've, by yeah. default, have a, have a low number. <laughs> Brilliant. There's 16 stickers on the Arsenal spread from the 96-97 season. Yeah. You're one of them. Do you think you can name the under-15 for us? Oh, God, you never told me it was a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little warm-up. 1997 98 96, 97. Sorry, 96. <laughs> Getting the year might help. <laughs> David Seaman, Nigel yeah. Winterburn, yeah. Tony Adams, mm-hmm. Steve Bold, Paul Merson. Yeah. Then Patrick wouldn't have been in because he signed that season. So he, no, he's in. He's in years. Oh, would he? Oh, yeah, right. He's there. in, yeah. Oh, Patrick. Patrick's got in then. Ian Wright. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to think whether... So if he's there, then Dennis Burkamp must be there. Yep. Uh, Ray Parler. Mm-hmm. Andy Linnigan. Yes, yep. ten. Five to go. You're missing Five. one defender. Missing one. Martin Keown. Mm-hmm. Yep. Was Lukey back then? Yeah. Yes. John Lukic, yeah. John Lukic. So, see, I, it's, I, I headed a lot of balls, you know. <laughs> Just, <laughs> <it's memories. Yeah. laughs> Good job you didn't ask me next year. I wouldn't have remembered anything. Um you're doing, you're doing very well. You've got a uh, midfielder. Kev and... Campbell? No, you do need no. a forward, though. Uh, with, I've said righty, mm-hmm. I've said Dennis Burkamp. Yeah. Oh my. John Artson. Yes. yes. Yeah. Two two to go. So you've got a oh. midfielder and uh, a winger. I don't associate him much with Arsenal. He's an England player. Midfielder. David Platt. Yes. One to go. Winger. Yeah. This, this lad, I watched play at Middlesbrough. And he was absolutely rapid and tore our fullback a new one. But he wasn't in the Premier League for very long. Glenn Elder. Yes. Yes. There we go. Well done. Well done. <laughs> That's impressive. Do I, get, I must get some sort of prize for that, surely. Well, Based on the fact you sprung it on me without any notice. What, man, if you'd you, give me notice, I'd have got them all straight away. Yeah, we've, yeah. Posted some, we've 
our sponsors tops have given us some stickers from the 97 book so we'll post some stickers out here as a, as a reward I also feel bad for Martin Keown Martin why <laughs> because we talk about the Arsenal back four and it's always like he's the extra one I'll tell you a story about that well you've just named him about 15 minutes after you got the Arsenal back four so <laughs> well, it just rolls off the, it just rolls off the tongue doesn't it normally but we um so I can't remember what se- well, I'll tell you what season it was. It was after the we'd won the double, so it must have been ninety eight, ni- the ninety eight season, and then so it must have been pre season following the the double. Uh, so ninety eight, ninety nine. So we had a, we have our usual photographs, uh, you know, with the kit, team photos, one day in pre season. So we train, run in the morning, then go back to the ground for our photos. So we're all in our kit on the pitch and we're all taking the team photos, individuals, da, da, da. and I thought, and all the trophies were there. So FA Cup, Charity Shield and the and the League Championship, you know, the Premier League title. And I was like, do you know what? We're, how often are we, we might not be together for much longer. So I, I went round the lads and I said to Baldy, Tony and Nigel, I said, I'd really like a picture of the four of us, really close <laughs> knit with the FA Cup, the Championship, you know, and, and then... Uh, and I thought that was a really good idea. And then until someone pointed out, and goes, well, is Martin going to be in it? And I went, oh, it, it doesn't look right with five in it. Just like... <laughs> so we basically sort of hung around on the pitch until Martin went in to get changed. <laughs> and, he was, and he was linging around and we were kind of got an ass. And, and I was like, just stay back, lad. So anyway, they, uh, he, he went down the tunnel and I got all the lads quick, got the photographer, lined everything up. I've got the picture. In fact, I've got it on my phone and it's somewhere in the loft somewhere. But I've got this picture of us, the four of us, down like that. And as we were getting down for the photo, he's just about to take and Ray Parler run down the uh, tunnel and shouted, Martin, the back four are having a photograph of the picture. <laughs> and he comes, he comes running out. We all scattered. It was We were so scared of him. He was like uh. trying, to, trying to get... It's just like, you know, it's, it was like the... Uh, it was like the the fifth musketeer or whatever. It was just <laughs> you could have got him to take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that would definitely not have gone down very well. No, oh, great. I was, we actually had a question about picture day. Was that a, a pain in the arse for players? Did you you know take your time to get your haircuts? You know, obviously it's happening in the middle of pre season. What was it like? Well, the, the only good bit about it was that we weren't running our taters off around a pit somewhere and throwing up behind a bush. So that was the, yeah, well, you got an afternoon off training. So it was looked upon as a, a, an afternoon off rather than a chore. But once you've, yeah, it, it, they do take ages. I think they're a bit better run now than the old sort of winding the film on and, you know, the old mm-hmm. tripod. It's all done very quickly now, but... Um, yeah, it's a bit of a pain because you, as you said, you've got to get your hair cut. Make sure you don't, make sure you, you know, put your stomach muscles out if you're on the front row. And I always used to Dave, me and Dave Seaman have a laugh because we, um, I invariably got, I was kind of put the put the unfashionable players like me and Nigel Winterburn, the full backs on the corners, you know, just get them out of the way somewhere. And I always used to, my, da- I think it was my dad always said to me. Make yourself look big and make yourself, you know, grow your hair. When I was a kid, I had quite long blonde hair. So if I was in a trial and I was playing around on a game and someone was, you'd always look at the lad with the long hair. He was like, even if you're any good or not, you kind of catch the eye. And he always said to me, if you get, when you get in the team photos, stand on your tiptoes and make yourself look big because people will go, God, he's a, you know, you might get a signing on the fact that you're a big, a big fullback at the far post, you know. So I always used to be on my tiptoes. <laughs> Dave used to go, Dick, oh, get off them tiptoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Dave Seaman talks, by the way. Um, yeah. I'm looking at the picture now, actually, and you are middle row. You're fairly central, actually. But I'll tell you what stands out in this picture. Is it Steve Morrow? Just looks like. A lost geography teacher amongst other footballers. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, not long after that picture, Arsene Wenger, the geography teacher, turned up as our manager. <laughs> <laughs> From that, that group of players that you mentioned, I presume you're still in touch with them, are you? Who's, who's the last one you spoke to? Uh, D- Dave Seaman's my, my best mate. We used to room together. Um, for many years, um, so you kind of grow, you know, grow very close to your roommate because you, you're with him an awful lot of time. So we we used to room together with England as well when I was in the squads. So I'd speak I'd speak to Dave 
you know, once, sometimes twice a week. We play when we can play, when the government will let us go and play golf in a big open field with nobody around, then um, mm. see my dig there at the uh, yeah, it's very the, the lack of golf. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we play a lot of golf together. I still, still see Wrighty, we play golf as well. And Tony Adams, they're kind of like my four mates that I've stayed more in touch with. But I see the I see a few, I see Baldy now and again at the training ground or Nigel I bump into at, at the games. So we still sort of see each other. A few of the lads have been working in the media anyway, so you kind mm-hmm. of, you know... You're not far, you're not too far away. You mentioned your dad at the start there, Lee. He was actually a footballer, played for Man City. That must have been quite cool as a youngster having a footballer dad. Well, he was yeah. It was back in the fifties, so he he was a very good amateur goalkeeper, and uh, he got his chance to sign pro for Man City in the fifties. But unfortunately, or fortunately, because my dad talks about Bert Troutman as you know his idol, who's the German goalkeeper who famously broke his neck in the cup final. And played on by just rubbing a bit of deep heat on it, you know. It's like, <laughs> right, I'm ready to go. Um, a little bit like the footballers these days, you know. Mm, when they, just like that. When they yeah. St- yeah. So, um, but he was his understudy, and he because Bert was so good, uh, and my, my dad wasn't quite good enough. He never really got a chance. He got picked for one game, and I think it was an FA Cup replay midweek against Luton Town. Ironically, because I made my debut for Arsenal against Luton. And my dad was going to make his debut for the first team in Man City. And on the way down on the motorway, the fog came down and they cancelled the game and oh, they turned no. the coach around and went back. Oh, God. <laughs> and on on the Saturday, Bert's thumb was miraculously better and mm. uh, that was it. So he never played in the first team. But yeah, he was football through and through. So growing up as a kid, he was, you know, my dad would always be playing football with me, taking him to games. And so I, 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 I often joke, with him to this day that I you know I I played the career through my dad's eyes because he was he wasn't good enough to uh, to quite make it so and that's why he was you know he came to every game he drove down to Arsenal from Manchester every Saturday to to watch games and um, yeah he's certainly my biggest biggest supporter. So you signed for Burnley initially I believe as an apprentice back in the early 80s and yeah. played a few professional games for them before moving to Chester, I believe. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Correct, yes. We were 90... When I signed for Chester, I actually didn't know... I knew what league they were in, but Burnley said to me, look, there's two clubs come in for you, Crew Alexandra and Chester. And I went, Crew's not far. Chester, where? I don't even know what league Chester is. <laughs> so I had a little look and I sort of looked down the league and I was like, right, they're not in the, as it was then, not in the third division. So I was like, they must be in the fourth. So I went down the fourth and I got down to 91st and I still hadn't got to them. And I went, <laughs> went to 92nd and sure enough, Chester were there with about 11 points sitting on the bottom of the football league. And in those days, it was, you had to vote for re-election. It wasn't automatic. You know, you, the the chairman had to write a letter if you finish bottom to all the other chairmen saying, "Please let us stay in the league. We think we offer this." And then the chairman vote on whether you go down or you stay up. So I signed for him, and we finished ninety second, and uh, and that was it. I was like, oh, I might not be a pro footballer anymore because we might get, you know, bombed out of the league. In the end, we got re-elected. So John McGrath, who was well, Newcastle. John McGrath, centre half for Newcastle. He's dead now, bless him. He was manager of Chester, and he came to all the players and he said, and I'm not, I'm not sure this is strictly legal. Well, it certainly isn't now, but came to us and he said, right, I'm signing 13 f- lads on uh, on free transfers in the summer. We're going to have a massive season next year. We're going to get promoted, so you're not having any bonuses next year. And we were on about 15 quid a win or something. So it wasn't a lot of money anyway, but he said, we're not having any bonuses. You win a game next year, you're not getting anything. And the chairman is going to put a bet on us to get promoted. And he's going to put five grand on us to get promoted at 50 to one. And then we're going to split all the money at the end of the season when we when we go up. And the lads were like, yeah, we're in the dressing room going, yes, come on, lads. This was pre-season. And there's 14 new lads in we didn't even know. They were all going, yeah. So it was going to be like the best season ever. And uh, we finished 91st. <laughs> <laughs> we literally went, dump, we went one, we went one spot up. It was like, uh, so I, th- at that point I had to leave and see if I could do, do a, a better job and 
then I went to Bury in League uh, in League Three. So that brings us around quite neatly to to Arsenal, where you signed in January '88, I believe. Can you describe the Arsenal that you arrived at versus the one that you left? Well, you you have to understand that the Arsenal that I arrived at from my position now, having played and and retrospectively looking back, it was a slightly different version or a vision than I had when I when I signed because when mm. I signed I was very as I said a very nervous very scared young footballer who was thinking so anybody who was at the club at the time was an absolute legend as far as I was concerned and I remember walking in on a Tuesday morning when I signed and we used to train at Highbury on a Tuesdays and do a physical round the pitch do loads of running around the pitch go in the gym do a load of weights and then go in the gym for a five aside. that was like a we used to call it fizz day because it was physical and that's what we did and my first sign training session was on a tuesday so i drove to highbury and i went into the amazing walked up the the marble steps to the marble halls saw um herbert chapman looking at me and thought wow this is it this is where it all starts I walked down this beautiful i don't know if you've ever been inside highbury but it's it was one of the most beautiful Art Deco buildings, really polished old oak everywhere, marble. It's it's just a, an absolute amazing stadium, and a lot of it's still there because they built flats, but they kept the main bit. And walked down to the dressing rooms, and these massive big wooden doors. I pulled them open, and David O'Leary was standing right in front of me, and I kind of went, "Oh God, I just love the <laughs> <laughs> oh, And he, went, he he just looked at me, and he went. He almost like am I a ball boy or something? What am I doing here? Was like, <laughs> so he looked at me and he went, "All right, Lee, nice to have you on board." And I was like, "Hello, David." And David Rowcastle came up. Tony Adams was taking a Mickey out of somebody because Tony was a brash, young, you know, captain type figure. And I, I was just in. In Kenny Sansom then came up to me and I was like, I couldn't even speak to Kenny because Kenny was a bit of a legend as far as England fullbacks were concerned, and I used to. Idolise, you know, his type of player. And I sort of looked at him and went, God, that's Kenny Sanson. And I got my kit and I put my kit on, it didn't really fit. I felt really, <laughs> I was like, oh, my shorts are too big and, you know, dangling off me. Oh, I felt terrible. But my vision of them then was of a, of a, of a team that was a team, you know, it was already an established pre, uh, first division team. When I look back now, you know, with knowing a bit more, it was the real beginnings of something really special, and I didn't realise at the time because it was had this real cool mix of senior players. Um, you know, John Lukic wasn't that senior, but he'd been there a while, and David O'Leary was like the godfather of the place, walking around, and all this amazing young talent. Because George, when he first came in, was like, right, get rid of all the prima donnas, old ones who are not going to do it and you can work out who they are but I don't want to you know uh, use their name in vain or anything there but the the older players who who he thought were, weren't hungry enough weren't um, the right type to build a team around and then all these kids were like you know Michael Thomas David Rowcastle Paul Davis was one of the senior ones and there was a real cool mix Nigel Winterburn had signed six months earlier and it was like when I look back now, I was like, and because we made eighty nine the documentary, we looked into all of that. You know, we did a lot of filming about that. We did a lot of talking about it. So it really brought it home to me what a special, and I didn't know it at the time, but what a special kind of bubbling away um, team that was, just getting ready to go. And George, you know, that was his vision. That's what he wanted to put a load of kids in that were hungry from the lower leagues that really wanted it and mix it with the talent that he had coming through from the academy and with a few older guys there. And it absolutely, you know, it 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 took off, really did. We spoke at the start of the podcast about why we're doing a podcast on 1990s football. And I think one of the main reasons is that football looked so different in 1990 than it did in 2000. It was the decade where it all changed. There was a huge drinking culture among players. Was there? <laughs> do you remember the last time you had a beer on a bus back from a match because I think good... that was the turning point it was I mean it would have been 
it would have been post Wenger, so that was the last time because you know we used to you know the kit man was the kit man's always in your pocket. You know you've got the first person you look after at any football club's a kit man, regardless of whether you get on with him or not. And we had a few good ones along the way, and uh, and we used to make sure that he understood that you know, get the beers in on the coach at the back and we sneak them out and put them in plastic cups. And, you know, I don't think Wenger knew what was going on. i never forget, we did a pre-season. We were away, I think it was his first pre-season. Tony, you have to remember as well, that Tony uh, got sober in 96. So he'd stopped drinking in 96 and Wenger was obviously arrived. So, um, and Tony was our skipper. We're on pre-season tour. I think we're in Switzerland or somewhere. And we got a game and the lads... And pre-season's hard, so you don't want to be, you know, going out drinking. But in general, you kind of... After a game, you know, if you want to relax and just have a couple of beers, then normally that's OK. So we got back off this uh, game, night game, and got back to the hotel and go up for our evening meal because we need, we hadn't eaten since five o'clock or something. So there was a meal laid on for us. So all the senior players go to one table, all the sort of mixed mid seniors and few kids and then the youngsters are on another table and the staff are on another one so the senior players you know go over to the the big table and um and I said and I'm I'm standing there and I'm going I said tone is there any chance you know there's water on all the tables I said, any chance we can have a beer can you ask Gaffer who can have a beer and he went oh. I said, well, you're a captain. I said, you don't mind going in for a pay rise, do you? But, you know, when you have to do <laughs> something with the lads, and I know you're not drinking beer, but come on. So well, you got to put under pressure. So he goes over and asks Arsene, and we, he, he leans, he's going... Sh, 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 sh. So he turns around and he goes, so we all went, oh, brilliant. <laughs> so um, this is Wenger in a nutshell, because he's got a brilliant sense of humour. You know, he's a bit... We all, you know, he's a bit clumsy at times and a bit, he had a nickname of Cluso because things would go wrong if he touched a, a TV, the, you know, the area will fall on the floor and it just things seemed to happen to Arsene. He was, he was, a, he was a funny guy. They had a really good sense of humour. And uh, so we all sat down, we're all really excited, started eating our meal and the waiter, come, waiter comes in from the thing with a massive big silver tray like that with one beer in the middle. He comes over like Because Tony yeah. said, can they have a beer? So he went, oh, yes, no. of course. <laughs> so we come over with one bottle of beer and that, we were like that. And then Wenger's like sitting there laughing his head off, <laughs> thinking he's the funniest man in the world. So, uh, little did he know we had the load in our room. Yes, of course. <laughs> So you used to go for the, the physical days on a, on a Tuesday. And I think I've heard stories from Ray Parler about was it Tuesday Club that followed? <laughs> you must have some belters. The odd Tuesday was um, the odd. Tu- we, it didn't happen all the time because there was the people. You know, when you talk about the Tuesday Club, people say, uh, "Oh, you want to go on the lash every Tuesday, like all day, all night." I was like, "No." So maybe once a month we'd have a team. You know, because if there's a midweek game, we never did. So it'd have to be a free week. We'd have to be at the ground for a fizz sometimes we were at the training ground so it didn't quite work because we're further away from London so it was only you know in a season you know we probably if we did eight in a season is you know it was maybe nine then maybe ten or something like that but it wasn't every week but we <laughs> George used to George used to know exactly when we were going out because he we'd all come into training like suited and booted and not su- <laughs> not suited but all dressed. You know, normally you got a tracky bottoms and t shirt on and you come in with your wash bag looking a you know, like you'd just come off the street somewhere and then all of a sudden on Tuesday we'd come he'd come in the dressing room and he'd, he'd literally walk around the dressing room and see all these nice shirts and what so we used to sort of hang T shirts over the top of them to try and hide the fact that we've got an Armani shirt underneath it or whatever. So he used to know and then he because we were off Tuesday uh, we'd work hard Tuesday, we'd be off Wednesday and then come in Thursday. But there was a few occasions where and certainly reading Tony's book was really eye opening for me. Because we'd, I'd read his book about one of those occasions we'd go out on a Tuesday and I'd be like, oh God, I remember that. I remember that particular time we went out and whatever happened and, oh yeah. And I'd go, and then I'd turn the page and then I'd go, yeah, yeah. And then I'd kind of find the moment where I'd go home at sort of maybe 
10, 11 o'clock because we've been, we'd been out since, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon. So mm. it's like about 10 o'clock, I remember. And then I kind of go and there'd be another eight pages of the chapter <laughs> and I go... <laughs> And I'd find out that Tony didn't go home till Thursday morning when he went straight to training. So he'd missed the whole, he'd been out the whole of Wednesday. And I'd gone home on the Tuesday night, played golf on the Wednesday, took my kids to the zoo on the Wednesday, coming for training on the Thursday. And Tony was still out. It's <laughs> like, wow. So he properly give it a bash, you know, and he's, and that's in his book, you know, he's, I'm not divulging private information. He's, that's how he lived his life. And, um, you know, thankfully he, he, he got himself clean and sober and he's living an amazing, you know, his best life now. One question which I wanted to ask you, I didn't know where to slip it into the uh, into the interview, but you've gone from wearing, you know, tiny shorts and baggy shirts to wearing baggy shorts and tiny shirts. Did you have a preference in terms of the kit fit? And was there ever a chance that you could um, come flopping out? <laughs> 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 no, we are, we are, no, the kind of tight shorts were always, they were pretty much in when I was starting off and then they, they progressively got a bit bigger, but I always used to, I didn't like long shorts, I didn't, I hated having anything long shorts and in, nowadays, you know, the kits are so tight and streamlined and, and almost made to measure on the players, there's nothing, mm. you know, there's nothing left for chance, it's, it's just... You wear the kit, it's almost painted on. Mm. And the kits, you know, when I was predominantly playing, were never, you know, it was like you you ask the kit man to put a pair, of, a pair of small shorts out for me. And then if for any reason he forgot, and he'd go, <laughs> uh, there'd be a pair of large. I said, where's me? <laughs> oh, I gave them to uh, Anders Limpar. And I was like, well, there's only one pair. You know, it was the kits weren't, I mean, they give the kits away now. Every You know, we gave a, give a shirt away back in the day. And the kit man would literally go, I remember him standing at uh, uh, Tony Donnelly, the old kit man I first got there. And I think we were in a European game and somebody gave the kit away to one of their players. And he made the player go into the away team dress room, get the shirt back. Oh, it's no. like, no, we need that for Saturday. It was like, <laughs> hang on. Because he, like, they'd have one set of kit and then have a spare. And if you give a shirt away, then you shirt down and you'd have to wait for Adidas or whoever it was to. And I, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but he did make the player go in and get the shirt back because we weren't allowed to swap shirts. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly not in Premier League games. European, you might get away with it. it was, you know, you'd say, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do it. Mm. On a Saturday, if you're playing against somebody and you're, you know they swap shirts all the time. You couldn't do it then. The mm. answer to I've, I've avoided your your, your question. So. <laughs> it speaks volumes. <laughs> Just as we've started talking about shirts, I've noticed over your left shoulder a folded yellow shirt with JVC on the front. Oh yeah, I'll show you that. The reason I've got that here is because I've moved house and it's was in a frame and I didn't like the frame. It was in a frame in the loft because I've got I don't have any things out. It was in the loft and I took it out of the frame and I've just kept it in here. But this is my eighty nine shirt. Mm. Um and I got it signed on the day or the night after or whatever. So that that's So that's the that's shirt you wore at Anfield. Yeah and to prove it, look, <laughs> see this see this watch this for a sly tackle. It's still got the mud on the back. Wow. Anfield mud. Anfield. It has been washed. It's just the mud didn't come out. So I've that still got it. And it still fits. That's amazing. more impressive, isn't it? It's still fits. Prove it. Prove it. <laughs> I'll put it on. I'll put it on here. Don't want to see no, the striptease. I'll, I'll put it now. I won't take my t shirt off. I'll just save the viewers. This is amazing. <laughs> is this shirt on your house insurance, by the way? Because that is serious uh, memorabilia. Yeah, well. That's great. No, it's not. Yeah, look. <laughs> see, it still fits. That is brilliant. It's like a modern shirt. When I was wearing that in 89, it was like really baggy, but yeah. I'm going to take it off because it's too hot. Great. That's a bo- that's a, a real bonus for us that you just so happen to have the 89 shirt. Yeah, and it wasn't, shoulder. it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't placed there for any yeah. reason otherwise. This old thing. Have, yeah, not this. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple of questions about 89. But okay. um, one thing we wanted to ask you about is you seem like you were one of those, you know, really nice guys, nice players, but you were involved <laughs> in a few brawls, mass brawls. I'm thinking 21-man brawl at Old Trafford. There was one at home to Norwich. 
you were involved in a little one with David Ginola, which I remember as a Newcastle fan in the League Cup quarterfinal. Can you speak to us about a few of those? You're mixing me up with somebody else, I don't know. (laughs) Right, I'll I'll put you straight on all of those. So, (laughs) the Norwich one, we got a penalty during the game and our penalty taker wasn't playing and no one wanted to take the penalty. So, I grabbed the ball, put it down on the spot and took my first penalty in professional football against Norwich. We were 2-0 down. I scored it, 2-1. We equalised, 2-all. And then last minute of the game, we get another penalty and I pick the ball up and I'm going to be a hero. So I hit it to Gunny's right. He saves it, hits his hand, comes back. And in those days, the pitch at Highbury was terrible. It was bobbling around and I thought, I'm just going to sky this in the north bank. So I hit it in the ground and it didn't get a lot on it, to be fair. And it bobbled. It went over the line and I win the game 3-2. So I run off down the pitch, hero. The crowd are going mad. Alan Smith had run in to tap the ball over the line, but he didn't quite get there because it nearly didn't go in. And a load of their players went in and started punching Alan. So all our players kept dived in and there was only one player not involved in that fight and that was me because I was running <laughs> around the pitch going, I'm a hero. So that was the first one I wasn't in. I didn't get to the uh, the Battle of Old Trafford when Nigel got kicked by McClare and Anders Limpar laid the best right hook I have ever seen. Any boxer would have been proud of it on McClare to try and get him off Nigel. He just went bang and he hit him on the ear and his ear literally just went and um just literally just just unfolded it just went oh it was all, and i just got there at that point um because again i was on the opposite side of the pitch it was like left wing and i was right back so by the time i got there it was over what was the other fight you mentioned Ginola. He, he oh i watched uh, yeah. the footage of this recently no and it, it, uh, to be fair it's inconclusive no it's not no, I'll show you the dental bill. I had two and a half. I nearly sent it to him actually. I had two and a half thousand quids worth of dental work done on. A, he broke a crown at the back of my tooth with his elbow. Now I fully deserved the elbow. I'll let me just say that I booted him all over the place that game, and the the straw that broke the camel's back was he went short to a ball like he always did and, I, and he was just he, he was right at the end of his tether and I knew he was just about to crack I thought I've got him here because I kicked him all over the place first off felt bad about some of the tattles I put on him a little bit and then mm. um, he just went for this ball and I just tugged his shirt just as he started to go and he went like that and he just went bang and I and I just leaned in and he caught me on the side of the mouth there and my tooth broke in my and I, he, for a minute I was I was in a bit of trouble, Sparko wise. And then and I'll never forget being carried off on a stretcher past Kevin Keegan and he was he was just going, You cheating bastard. You cheating <laughs> and I, was, I was like, hang on a minute. So So those three fights you mentioned, I was I didn't throw one punch and I got beaten up by David Ginola. <laughs> Do you, want to, nice guy do you want to rephrase the question now? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I did. Just didn't tally with nice guy Lee Dixon and all these roles that Arsenal were involved in. So thanks for clearing that up. Now then, we're very lucky on this podcast to be sponsored by Tops Match Tax. Tops are the company that Merlin became. And they've sent us a load of their... 2021 merch it's a Champions League sticker book and loads of packs of stickers and we've got some stickers here and we're going to open them we do now have you first and foremost catch stuck in your stickers from last week well what I did was we did a few pack openings and I've actually stuck a load in at once and it's been amazing haven't done this for maybe 25 years Mm. and I forgot how small the stickers are but Mm. how the more as you stick them into the page the pages become easier to turn the the pages become (laughs) a bit more robust (laughs) <laughs> oh, I just, you know how the, the sticker book feels, but then you, it starts to develop a bit of um, yeah. rigidity once you get mm. the stickers in there. People and also the shiny them. stickers. Yeah, the shiny stickers have got a nice kind of flexible, you know, thickness to them, which, are, which Interesting. It, they're the ones you want. And they're the ones I love peeling and sticking in the book. So that's a few observations. I've- Whilst we're making ridiculous observations, I love the fact that, I don't know if you've noticed this yet, Ketch, but the stickers, if you fold them, the back sort of pops open from the middle. So you're not for, for yeah. fingering at the corner of the sticker now, you can rip it down the middle. You haven't noticed the that yet, modern have you? day sticker. I can tell you haven't noticed that yet. I have a confession to make before we get any further. We're Go supposed on. to be opening a pack a week on these podcasts. Oh, you've been I've gone. Down. I've gone hell for leather. 
I've gone off oh, great. I couldn't resist. Listen to this. Tops noise. This is it. the sound of my Champions League tin. Within it, I have got Ooh. absolute reams of swaps. So, okay. I want to hear you open your stickers, and I'm yes. going to be picking out ones that I need as you go. I'm going to be okay. making a little mental note, because I reckon I've got about 40 swaps here. So, really? Get stuck in. So I've I've done about I've done about five packets of stickers and I haven't got any swaps yet. Well, I've probably Not done about thirty swap. packs, and right then. It's, it's so addictive I can't stop. Here's my ten pack of Champions League stickers. Mm-hmm. Oh, Gio Reyna, Dortmund, shiny. Got. Ha <laughs> really? Ajax, shiny. Yeah, I love that badge. Amazing. Yeah, you need it. The, the, the badges for me are the best stickers in the book. They look yeah, so it, good. It, it really is great. I've got the Ajax badge. Kalon Navas. Need. Christian Pulisic. I've got him sitting right here. Cool. Okugawa, Japanese player for RB Salzburg. No, don't know him. Got a Leipzig player here, German, Halstenberg. I'm going to need you to speed this up, Ketch. I'm too eager. Thomas Muller. Got. The Shakhtar, Ukrainian, Sergei Kristov. Kristorov. Okay, so I don't think I've got him. Matt Hummels. Oh, good player. Got those, sadly. Anthony Marshall. Hmm. That's all. That that's it. it. Oh god, I hope you might have. I mean, I've got I've always. I've got like Rashford. I've got Pogba. I've got Edison. I've got all these shinies. I've got the youth Champions League winners shiny. I've got Ansu Fati rising star twice. Demba Bar about three times. <laughs> so yeah, we need to start cracking on with opening some of these because I really want to get my book filled. But um, if any listeners are doing the Champions League book with their kids or doing it themselves and have got swaps and want to get involved with us, you know, contact us on our website searchforshinies.com. Get us on Twitter and Instagram at the Shiny Pod. Let's do some swaps. Yes, please. Let's get on with it and let's get back to the Dixon. We get on to 88-89 then, the yeah. Michael Thomas game. Obviously, you mentioned the documentary already, but um, can you give us a bit of insight into your memories of that? It was a season full of um, expectation. We, George, I think George was ready for us to sort of show us, show everybody what he'd built in a short space of time. Um, we started off the season brilliantly well, and by Christmas time, we were top, um, and everything looked rosy. But the minute we got to the top we started thinking, oh, we're at top. And then because we're quite a young team, we just, just fell apart like a... We folded like a cheap suit. We just went. There was... Uh, and we started losing games and Liverpool went on this unbelievable run like only they could of win after win after win. And we could see them coming up behind us going, hang on a minute. And then, But then it was all in our hands. We had... Um, we had Derby at well, the last three games. We had Derby at home, Wimbledon at home, and obviously the Liverpool game had been postponed because of Hillsborough, so that was pushed back two weeks after the season finished. So, but it was fine because we just beat Derby and beat Wimbledon, who were both floundering somewhere, um, and we got beat <clears throat> beat by Derby. Um, Tony Adams had an absolute nightmare that day, um, and Dean Saunders just ripped him. You know, as you said, you said before, ripped him a new one. We lost two one, and I never forget on that day we was, as we were driving to the ground. There was a guy outside selling, you know, those enamel badges. You know, that you all different enamels, mm. and he had about ten of different ones saying, you know, league champions nineteen eighty eight eighty nine. So he'd already had the the badges made, <laughs> and I'll never forget when we drove out the game. I was looking for him to see whether he'd like <laughs> what he'd done with them yeah. or because we were. It was virtually over then, and then obviously we we lost. Uh, sorry, we drew against Wimbledon on the Tuesday or Wednesday night, and then it was just. And um, we were in. A, I was in a restaurant when when Liverpool were playing West Ham, their game in hand on the midweek, and I was in a restaurant in the middle of che- uh, Hertfordshire somewhere, trying to avoid the result because I was like, I don't really want to see him, you know, bag a load of goals, and because I knew the the league was pretty much feeling like it was over. And uh, so I was in this restaurant and I was eating my soup. And how's my luck? The kitchen door opened. Obviously, Liverpool had gone 1 0 up. It was about 10 past 8 or something. I was eating my soup and this scouser from the kitchen put his head out and went, Hey, La, 1 0. And then he went back and I went, You're kidding me? In the middle of Hertfordshire. <laughs> so every five minutes he kept coming out going, 3 0, La. And I was like, God, and they obviously scored five. And. Um, got to the point where I'd worked it out by then that we needed to win by two clear goals and uh, thought thought at that point that it's not going to happen and uh, we've you know we've, we've got nothing to lose we might as well go up there and have, give it a go and see what happens but in all in all honesty you know George was probably the most confident out of all of us you know we had to go out and play he was just doing the 
tactics and he, he absolutely thought we were going to win 3-0. Um, and I was like, we were looking at him going, he's mad. We'd only played with three at the back and two wing backs once that season against United away. And, he, you know, a few days before the game, he goes, I'm going to play with, uh, you know, three centre-backs. And we all went, but we we play 4-4-2. And he's like, yeah, but not tonight. You know, you and I'm going to push on Barnsley and Nigel's going to push on Houghton. They're their two best creative players. And we're going to stop them playing. And Rushy, fortunately, got an injury and went off in the first half. So we got rid of him. And then John Aldrich came on. And, um, yeah, and it was just, it was just an incredible... I can I can virtually remember every I don't remember a lot of games now because there's so many but that game was just because we made the dock as well I remember I've watched so much footage of the game that we didn't use it's almost like I could tell you exactly where I was on any point during the 90 minutes hmm. yeah you executive produced the 89 documentary which is about specifically about that game and that season I watched it the other week I would urge all of our listeners to, yeah. to watch it. I watch it with my girlfriend who's a part-time Arsenal fan born okay. after 89. She didn't know what happened. So we sat and watched it and it wow. unfolded and she was beside herself. She was like, yeah. he's going to score. He's going to score, isn't he? And So if you can find someone oh, who doesn't amazing, know what happened yeah. to oh, watch it. That would have been amazing, brilliant. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's fast forward then to the the reason we, we're doing this podcast, the 96-97 season. You know when you said at the start of this, you're, you're not tight for time, are you? I, I know, I know. <laughs> so it's an interesting season. Bruce Rioch was sacked. Stuart Houston came in as caretaker until the middle of September. Then Pat Rice had a go. And then this guy called Arsene Wenger arrived. Was it a bit of a crisis time for Arsenal? It was a bit because we'd had a we'd had the season under, under Bruce. And it was, I have to say, it was pretty terrible. I didn't, you know, I was... I didn't like his his way. I didn't enjoy. We played with a sweeper. That's uh, three at the bat, and me and Nigel played wing backs. And I'd not really played that position much. Didn't like it. It was a lot of running. You know, it was a lot of stuff. I'd, you know, I was a good defender. I liked to break into an attacking role as opposed to being in it all the time. And for wing back, you just basically run up and down from box to box the whole game because you you know it's, it's you're not needed on the cover as much defensively. They need you up the other end. And you're expected to be both ends at once. So it's kind of like, I didn't enjoy that season at all. And so I, I wasn't surprised Bruce went. I, I, we had heard rumours that they were only waiting for Arsene Wenger anyway. So it was kind of like, you know, he had a season and that was, you know, it went, he went in pre-season, which was a bit weird. They kind of got rid of him. So Stuart took over. And I think Stuart at some point, because we started to play the season and I think he thought he might get a chance of getting the job but they'd always got Arsene lined up and um, you know he just needed to to see out his contract because he's not a contract breaker as we as we know so um, we knew his name and that was about it didn't know anything about him in manager in Japan why have we you know He's got a name that matches the club. It's a bit weird. <laughs> you know, he's a geography teacher. When we turned up, he just looked like Mr. Smithdale from 4B <laughs> in my grammar school. It's like a bit weird, but it was amazing. You know, amazing opportunity for us to open our our minds to a different way of preparing, stretching, training, uh, recovery, all of that and ex- be expansive and expressive on the pitch, which was all the things that we were kind of, I think, kind of ready for. What were some of the day-to-day changes that you brought in then? Well, the the, the biggest ones were the pre-training, like we stretch for, God, we'd, just, we'd come in and we'd be like, right, we're going to stretch now in the gym. Like, lads would be like, stretch in the gym before we go out and stretch outside. Yeah, we'd do a stretch session before we warm up. It's like... <laughs> Okay, so we'd do that, and then we'd go outside and we'd do a bit of a warm-up, then we'd stretch, and then we'd do some 8v8, some pattern of play, and then we'd stop and do a bit of a stretch, and then we'd stretch after training, then we'd go in the gym and do strength work on our legs and then stretch. I mean, I could put my leg behind my ear by the time I was, like, three months in. Um, and it was... So that that side of things was, was totally different, so really intense. We'd train a little bit more in the afternoons, Training wasn't physically hard. It was just a lot of football. Um, pre-season was an absolute piece of cake. It's like not George used to run us till we were sick. And, 
and um, Bruce Rioch as well. And he came in first day of pre-season. He goes, OK, we do some stretching, obviously. Um, and then we're going to do a 12-minute run. And we know what 12-minute run is. When I did it with George, we run for 12 minutes around the pitch, just like that, until you drop. And then after 12 minutes, you get up and you do something else. And he would go, he'd set these cones in a big square, put us in fast group, slow group, medium group. I was quite quick and fit, so I would be in the fast group. And I was like, right, right. So standing there, like getting ready to go, 12 minute run, going to go as hard as you can for 12 minutes. It's like, it's going to be hell. <laughs> and he went, right, go. And I, we'd all set off, and he'd go, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. And we're like, <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, by the time you get to that bollard over there, that cone, it's uh, 25 seconds. I literally could have walked there in 25 seconds. <laughs> so he's like, we'd, we'd, we'd jog to this thing, and he'd go, yep, next 25, yep. And then, yeah, and do that for 12 minutes. And wouldn't even, no sweat, wasn't even out of breath. I was like, so that pre- then the next day you do a six minute run and a 12 minute run, it'd be slightly higher pace, but it was so gentle. It built you into it, so gentle. And it got to the, the first pre season towards the end of it. You didn't, we had like seven or eight games set up to play. And I, played the first game pre-season and took me off after 40 minutes. And I was like, what? He goes, no, no, that's enough. Second game, I'd play 60 minutes. That's it. So I played six games before the start of the season. I hadn't finished 90 minutes. I hadn't done one 90 minutes. And I was like, I said to Tony, we're, we're in big trouble here. We're not fit enough. I, how can I go, go and... We had Man United in the charity shield before the season started. So we're going to get absolutely battered. He said, I just don't feel fit. And then, so we went to see him, me and Tony went to see him and said, lads don't feel, you know, like we need to do a bit more leading up to the season. And he went, in this really confident French accent, he went, no, you'll be fine. You you will get stronger. And I was like, will we? We played United Charity Shield about 120 degrees on the pitch. And I was thinking before the game, oh, this is going to end really badly. And we absolutely battered them. And we won 3-0 and I've never felt fitter. It was like, the man's a genius. You know, his ability to be able to prepare players for games is one of his massive strengths. He kind of knows you better than you know yourself. We want to talk about a couple of things that happened during this season. Richie's had a look at your stats. You were booked on November the 16th, the 24th and the 30th. Were you planning a big Christmas that year? <laughs> He's on a ski trip away somewhere. <laughs> I think you'll find... <laughs> I think you'll find I was very rarely suspended and I was certainly never suspended at Christmas time so those okay. those okay. dates uh, uh, I think you've made them up <laughs> um, and you'll be you'll be well surprised as well to know to how many times so I played 619 times for Arsenal and I played 200 and whatever it was for other clubs how many times I was sent off in my career zero no come no, on come on I mean full back Chasing Giggsy round for 10 years. So <laughs> I was only ever sent off twice. So that's pretty, good. That, that's pretty, that's pretty decent. Does, both deserved? Both silly, really, yeah. Graham Lasso is a really good mate of mine now. Suck, sucked me into a tattle at Stamford Bridge where I just tried to... I, I, me and him used to have proper battles and we didn't like each other and I used to kick him all over the place and he just just got in a position where it was like I couldn't resist <laughs> sliding tattle. I was going to take the ball, take him and, and there was a big advertising hoard in there and I thought I could get him into that as well. He could really do some damage. <laughs> and he just toe-poked it past me as I got there and dived over and yeah, it was kind of silly. And he and he broke his thumb as well. And he had a bandage on his thumb and he was lying on, sitting on the floor and the ref came out. The ref couldn't wait to get the red card out. He was like that. He was like, Bang! And I, and I just kind of went, oh. And I thought, and as I, was going, as I was going to leave the pitch, Graham was still on the floor and saying, and I was saying, you're diving so-and-so. And, I, and then I saw his thumb, his bandage on his thumb, and I thought, oh. So I went, all right, Graham, you know what? No hard feelings. And I went to shake his hand on the floor. No, and I, no. And he went like this. He put his hand up and he saw my eyes go, oh. <laughs> so I was just going to get hold of his thumb. <laughs> and he just, I just got hold of his finger and I couldn't quite get hold of it. And he saw it. And we laugh about that 
because we do NBC commentary together and we laugh about that to this day. I said, you could be doing commentary with no thumb now. <laughs> That's a Vinnie Jones move, that. I'm surprised. Know, right? yeah. There's a theme being established here. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple of... You've already talked about Anelka. One of the players we want to mention uh, passing is Patrick Vieira. What kind of impact did he have when he joined? <laughs> Amazing. He, he he came before Wenger. He was a signing, and he was injured when he came. He had a Patrick had quite bad knees, and he had a I think he had a cartilage. He was struggling with his knee, so when he came, he didn't really train. He didn't look like a footballer. He's very gangly, and he's very young, and didn't seem to fit his body type thing. He was all a bit strange. Um, so we kind of thought, you know, what if we brought in? I remember him coming on against. He came on, I think, against. I don't know, Sheffield Wednesday at Highbury as a sub for his first game a while after he'd come and Wenger was there and he came on in the second half and he was like, wow, it was just incredible. And from that moment, he was in the team forever and uh, and went on to become one of the best, you know, all-round midfield players in the world. And, you know, we everyone wants to put midfield players in categories now and you know he's always an eight he's a six he's a four I'm like I have no clue what that is you know I'm not I'm not old school enough to to go to, you know I'm, I'm I work in football now in the media but there's so much rubbish talked about numbers on people you know oh he's, he's, he's an eight he can't play as a six I'm like what are you talking about well you know when he drifts from a ten to an eight he doesn't look the same player I'm like but it's like Fifteen yards. He's moved from there to there. He said, "It just drives me mad." I have to pet hate of mine as well. I cannot stand it. Absolutely and the, you know, you hate. talk about midfield players, and they say, "Well, he, you know, he's a holder. He doesn't. He doesn't go over that. He doesn't do this." It is absolute tripe. And they've. And I, I, I blame a lot of the the analytical side of the game is great. Don't get me wrong. I think mean, it's you know it's really useful. And but the stats and the stuff about possession and how many time, how many touches and perceived goals and goals gained and all that rubbish I'm like and they've made they've made the positions of footballers things now where they go oh he can't play there and he's got to do this Patrick and Manu Petit played every single every single blade of grass on that pitch every week so I don't get don't tell me he's a holding player or of course he Patrick's not going to get you 15 goals from midfield breaking into the box like David Platt does, so you can kind of label him as not a, you know, not a box to box goal scoring midfielder. But don't have to stick a number on him and say he's oh he, he's a four. He's got to sit in front of the. So you know the midfield. He was one of the, like Roy Keane. You know he was one of those all round midfielders who didn't have any weaknesses. He could win it. He could you know sit and hold. He could break into the box. He could. At one point he he didn't score many goes and then he started scoring a few. Because his feet were on back to front, we used to say in training. Because he was the worst. We used to do shooting practice, and he'd literally be shanking it all over the place. He was like, Are "Your feet on the right way round." It was like, mm. but then he, you know, he'd bang one in the top corner and uh, and win the game. So yeah, I remember when I get to Newcastle actually from about thirty five yards. Absolute beauty. That's the one I was thinking of when yeah. I. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, it's funny you should mention Newcastle. Because I was going to ask if you have any other standout memories of the 96-97 season. It was transitional Wenger coming in to lay the foundations for what eventually would become an amazing Arsenal side. But towards the end of the season, it unravelled a little bit. Robbie Elliott came and scored at Highbury and Newcastle won and you, you kind of dropped out of the European places. Yeah, it was... I, I, did, I vaguely remember it not being too disappointing. Because it was, we were still, you know, getting used to the manager, and it was all a bit. We weren't expected to win the league or something that year. You should have done a lot better than you did, but you kind of, you know, fell away, didn't you? Um, but yes. the um, <laughs> so it wasn't. It wasn't like oh, we were going for it, and we we didn't get anywhere near United. I think at some point we were top for I don't know five or six weeks at one point mid mid season, and um, but it never felt like. I certainly don't remember it feeling like it was a lost opportunity of winning the league. It was definitely a transitional period. And then, um, you know, finishing third. I think we were joint po- points with Newcastle as well, weren't we? we was, and Liverpool or something. Like, you know, it was like, it was quite tight apart from United pulling away with it at the end. But I don't remember it being a disappointing season. I don't go, oh yeah. Having said that, if we don't, if we're not challenging for the league, 
right up until the end. We were at a state where we were coming through a cup, being a cup team. You know, we've been the, the sort of mid nineties. We turned into you know the ninety three cup finals, the ninety four cup winners cup, losing the UEFA cup in. 95 and we kind of become a then the wilderness in 96 and we kind of become a cup team so we weren't expected to win the league so but there was hope you know Wenger brought definitely a hope of right well next season let's have a real go and you know we did just finally on that particular season obviously you had the likes of Vieira mentioned and, and Bergkamp do you know who won the um Premier League Player of the Season award Ravinelli <laughs> good guess no Janino <laughs> oh, oh, that's right. And you, do you know what? But the, but the fact that you were asking me, I was thinking it must be a, a Middlesbrough player, and he was the first one that popped into my head. Yeah, he did. Yeah, Sorry, I couldn't resist it. Quite. You had a good side then, yeah. didn't he? Even though you went down. You've mentioned David Seaman a few times, and it's something I've got to ask you. Surely, when he's growing that ponytail, somebody in the dressing room does something about it. How could you let him get away with that? Ha- hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just back up a little. Have you seen the size of him? <laughs> he got absolutely hammered on a daily basis. So we didn't let him get away with it, but there's no way anyone was taking a pair of scissors to it because that would have been that would have only ended in bloodshed. So he was a bit confused. You know, I was his room, I was his I was his roommate and he used to go he used to go in the shower when we used to room together and he'd go in the shower on the Saturday morning before a game and he'd come out and uh, He'd have washed his hair, and then he kind of go like this with his hair, and it was like this massive. He looked like the Lion King. It was just like, and I said, Dave, I said you've got to go out on the pitch with it like that, just one day. It'd just be hilarious. And he, he you know, obviously got to the point where there was a couple of times. There was there was a couple of times during a game. I remember him telling me that it was so long the ponytail that. Some I think some of it came out once, and he went up for a ball, and a big load of hair went in front of his face. <laughs> I said, I said that wasn't Naeem from the yeah, yeah, or Ronaldinho. <laughs> or Ronaldinho, yeah. <laughs> Ronaldinho, yeah. Ronaldinho, yeah. A lot of younger fans will know you as a co-commentator on FIFA. The video game. Do you play FIFA? Can you tell us about the grueling process of, of recording for that game? That's a pretty big deal that you do that. It's no, I don't play it. I've never played one game. <laughs> I knew about it. Knew my kids played it when they were younger. Uh, my kids are grown up now, so they they don't. The actual f- recording of it is brutal. It is absolutely brutal. Uh, we do about fifteen, sixteen days every year to top up the new game that's coming out so you have to keep topping up the the library of stuff that's so when you first take over which was three years ago they haven't got any of you on recording at all so that first year you have to do a lot and then each year you do probably equal amount topping up but the scripts um the scripts are like oh, in fact, I should have some somewhere but I don't know where they're... they're like this thick just for you going for a session you 10 o'clock in the morning and you come out at four o'clock in the afternoon and you can't speak your voices because you do you know you do a million things you, you, you go in at 10 and they might go right well we're going to do um we're going to do goals so when they say that you know your voice is absolutely <laughs> busted because you you have to do you probably do 50 60 even more goals where you're at the top of your range going rah, rah, you know shouting your head off and then you do 10 on the trot of all different ones, and you and you have to you have to think of them. You only get one example of what they want, and then they go right. Can we have fifteen more, all different? And you're like, oh, right, okay. So you, <laughs> it's it's mental. It's really really hard, but great fun. And the fact that I can, my daughter comes home from work and shouts at her boyfriend saying, "Can you turn me dad off the telly? I've had enough of him." <laughs> it's just brilliant. <laughs> I, I play from time to time, and I heard you say on the commentary. Um, and my ears pricked up straight away. I thought, this guy's lying. That he used to take penalties. I thought, how can a, a fullback in a team with the likes of Smith, Wright, Campbell, Henri, Bergkamp, Merson take pens? Yet you did. I'm a man, a man of many talents. I missed a few, but I started off really, really, you know, like 10, 12 on the trot without missing over three, two or three seasons. And then, uh, then one particular season, I missed, I missed one. And right, he was hovering in the background because I was taking him when he arrived. And he was like, right, Dicko, you've got one more and then I'm having him. And I, 
I missed another one, so I said, yeah, <laughs> the pressure was getting a bit too much for me. But I enjoyed it. I, I kind of, it's a bit, it's a little bit, you do enjoy it, but it's it's like a love-hate relationship with taking penalties because missing them is not, it's not a nice feeling. Lee, I've got a pundit question, and it's related to shoes. All the pundits wear shoes with white soles and black tops. Is this some kind of thing that you're oh, supplied with? Those, those or, trainer or, things. Yeah, where do you get them from? What's the deal? Have you got 10 pairs in your, in your wardrobe? It's funny you should say that. <laughs> I, I, I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. Why? I don't know. It became, well, do you know what it is? It's because as the, the dress code started to relax a little bit, you know, it's all suits and ties, and it's like no ties, just just a shirt and then trousers and shoes and then then someone I don't know who this person was because you weren't allowed to wear trainers on on air and then someone sort of took the gamble and wore those trainers that you're on about and uh, and got away with it it's like well actually technically they're not actually trainers and then as soon as that floodgate were opened everyone was like right Paul Smith get a load of them so it was like um, and uh, and I've oh, it's really bad because I literally just bought two new <laughs> <laughs> they do look pretty cool. I've been rumbled. I've got I've got a new pair of uh, green ones that are uh, bottle green that I really like. Yeah, you'll like them when you see them. <laughs> Can you um, tell us about some of your more awkward TV moments when it comes to punchery or, or little? There's been one or two little spats now and again which give you a sharp inhale of breath when you're watching them. The likes of I, I can think of I think Southgate. You and Keane had a bit of a funny one. That was mainly. Uh, Southgate and Keane I, I was on the periphery of that thankfully but when I when he started first doing his his work for ITV Roy Keane I'm quite an experienced broadcaster based on when I first started off some an old broadcasting friend of mine said to me when you start make sure you get used to talk back from day one so earpiece in your ear Get used to talk back going on in your ear while you're talking on TV because it'll it'll save your life one day, you know. And you are also become a valuable broadcaster because most footballers who start off in this they don't have talk back in, so because it's it is very unnerving when you first use it, as you as you probably know. And so, and I thought so from day one I got used to using it, and I I couldn't do a broadcast without one now. If I go on there. And they go, do you want talk back? And I'll go, yeah. I'll. And if you say, oh, we haven't got talk back, you don't need it. You're on your. I feel like give me something because I feel safe. I know what's going on in the gallery. I know what's coming. I know everything that's going on. So, Roy Keane doing the ITV highlights for Champions League and stuff. I'm sitting next to Roy, and he doesn't wear talk. He doesn't have talk back on because he's like just wants to go on and give his opinion, and that's he doesn't care if he talks over the advert or whatever. He's just like bang. <laughs> so, we're sitting there. Mark Pugach, Keen Roy's next to me, and sometimes Roy's he's a bit better now. But when he first started, sometimes he just come in and didn't doesn't fancy it, or he's in a mood, or just be a whatever's going on for him at that time. So he'd be very yes and no answers, very bland. He's not like that now. He's like properly engaged because he's he's having a proper go now. You know, he's he's engaged with it all. So Mark DeMuth, my producer, would be in my ear and I'd get the famous, and I've had it a few times, so Roy's giving very straight answers to Mark Pugat. So what do you think about this? And he's going, yeah, well, I thought he played well. And he's like, and then in my ear, I hear the words, poke the tiger. (laughs) 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 Oh, and I'm like, oh God. So now I've got to get Roy or, you know, get him a little bit disagree with him or do something that's a little bit different or something just to get him so I've got the job of poking the tiger so I I have to like so he might say oh Man City played well and I just go no I don't think they played well and you can see him like <laughs> start to get those eyes on and and so in the early days it was a little bit like that I mean he's not like that now he's he, thankfully he's kind of he's he's got the he understands the gig and he's good he's brilliant you know he's box office because you don't know what's you don't know what's going to come out of his mouth next, which is part of the jeopardy of working with him. <laughs> but me and him get on. Me and him actually get on really well. He's uh, I say he's got a bit of a soft spot for me, but he he kind of I think he he, he he I don't know. He just we seem to get on well. We we get on well off the off the, off off screen and and he's a he's a he, he's a football fanatic absolute football fanatic he'll come down from a we'll be at a tournament he'll come down and he'll go uh, what about Colchester last night the right back in the centre half and I'm like 
what about them? And he goes, oh, they had a good game and they won 1-0 and Mansfield got beat by Huddersfield. And it's like, he literally watches and listens to everything about football. He's, he's, uh, he's an incredible character. Did you ever have any incidents with him on the pitch or you you weren't there for the Vieira tunnel incident, were you? I'd, I'd left then. Um, no, I never, re- I stayed away from him. You know, I'd got f- <laughs> flipping Good Ryan Gig. I've got Ryan Giggs on the wing. I don't know if you noticed. Yeah. Last thing I can do is getting in midfield and getting involved with Kino. So I, he never really came over my side. He was just straight down the middle, wasn't he? Didn't wander off to the wings very often. So uh, no, I didn't, I didn't really have any run-ins with him, but they were fun. Watching other people, you know, Patrick, have, him and Patrick used to absolutely hate each other. It was brilliant, you know, really box office. Th- those games against United in those late 90s were just incredible games to play in. And I say, you know, Anfield 89 was the best game I was ever involved in as for, for what happened. But I, I do have to say that the semi-final against United in 99 when they won the, the treble... That semi-final at uh, uh, Aston Villa at Villa Park was it. It had absolutely everything in it from a from a an emotional point of view. Playing a game, it was the best all round game I ever I was ever involved in, and 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 I, and I lost. You know, it wasn't like oh yeah, a great victory. It just it took me to places I'd never been before. I was exhausted. I was, and I remember before that game, it was hilarious. We we're in the dressing room before the game, and they had playing Juve in the um, the following week, and Fergie was resting a couple of, or pulled a couple of players out and put them on the bench. So I think I think either Coley was on the bench, certainly Giggsy was on the bench. So the team sheet come on, and it got stuck on the wall like it normally does, and all the lads are like looking who's playing and look like that, and I think. Somebody turned around to me, and I think Dennis turned around. And he went, "Oh, Dicko, you lucky so and so. Giggs is on the bench." And I went, "Is he?" And he went, "Yeah, he's on the bench. You lucky git." And I went, "Hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. Just pack. how is that lucky?" And they were like, "Well, you you don't have to play against Ryan Giggs." I said, "No, Blonquist was playing left wing, and he was a bloody good player, by the way." I said, "Blonquist, I, I tell you exactly what's going to happen. Blonquist is going to play, and about." An hour, 65, 70 minutes, he's going to have knackered me out, he's going to go off, and Ryan Giggs is going to start warming up, and he's going to come on with 20 minutes to go. So i am not only got to play against Giggs, Bronquist and Giggs, I've got Giggs for 20 minutes when he's going to be flying, and I'm going to be knackered. How's that lucky? And they all went, it's a very good point, you're in the shit. <laughs> <laughs> so and sure true. enough, I was in the shit. We've been setting up this interview, which you've kindly done, and all the emails at the bottom say, um, I'm on my bike with a little bike emoji. You're a you're a, a keen cyclist as well. Yeah, I mean that that was born out of having a bad knee, so can't run, can't do anything too energetic on the knee, so but I can ride a but right riding a bike's been fine. Um and I'm just back on it, just starting to go back on it now after my op, so uh, which is great. I'm uh, I'm back on the bike, I'm doing trx i'm i'm getting fit now so that's brilliant and i just can't wait to to get on the golf course that's my real one uh oh i, I i'm quite sporty but that's the one thing that i'm completely obsessed with is golf can you tell us a bit about your wife's charity work yeah she's um she's got a um a dance company called the york dance project and she's set that up years ago in in Los Angeles she's brought it over she's English but she was living in LA she brought it over to the UK and it's only a small company she runs it herself uh, with a little bit of help here and there eight or so dancers part-time sort of come in and out when they're doing projects but it's just got bigger and bigger over the last few years and she said there's a charitable side to the to the company that does a lot of work with schools and underprivileged uh, areas um, like um, movement projects, movement uh, workshops um, around dance, but involving issues that kids might have in bullying, etc., things like that. So, just getting people involved in 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 movement and trying to think about movement in a different way that they can associate that with how they're feeling. A lot of there's a lot of things out there at the moment about how people are feeling and the fear of expressing yourself so it's all connected to that so we 
you know, I raise quite a bit of money each year on charity events and and um, and try to keep that side of her of her charity business going and the dance company. And yeah, we it's it's an amazing thing. It's just seeing kids doing stuff you know that's especially now we've been doing they've been doing loads of stuff on zoom things like this and just to see people moving and smiling and laughing and actually doing something physical is uh it's kind of brought on a whole new meaning to it now with this uh pandemic so hopefully we can get back to normal soon we can all go dancing together mm. yeah sounds yeah. great we sounds expect, great and we're expect gonna... to see one strictly <laughs> yeah, strictly. Well, strictly I've been asked knee. a few times and I've turned it down a few times. So oh, now I've got a new knee. Yeah, yeah. Never say never. Ooh, <laughs> interesting. Well, we're going to make a donation because we're so grateful for your time. We've had an amazing, oh, that's brilliant. Amazing, amazing, Thank amazing you. couple hours here. So lucky to, to hear these stories. So we're, we're delighted to have you on and we're going to make a donation. That's very kind of you. Great. Thank you. We've got one more question. We we're asking everyone who comes on searching for shinies to pick their shiny player. So this is the best player you've played with or against. Dennis Burkamp. Doesn't he? No one gets close. That's great, Lee. That's all of our questions and more. Uh, we're so we're so grateful to, to for you to do this. This is this is really great for us. We've loved it. It's mm. my Thank pleasure. And any any time. I hope so, it goes well with your launch. Right. Well, let's pause for breath. Lee Dixon. What a fine. What an interview. What a guy. Um, he gave us again two hours. I think we need to prep guests in future catch for going for longer than the one hour that we asked them for because that was over two hours two again. And, a half hours. Uh, and I have to say, some great stories. I did not ever think I'd be watching Lee Dixon undress via webcam, um, <laughs> but I can tick it off the bucket list because it happened. I <laughs> saw it. Arsenal, I put witnessed. the eighty-nine shirt on. What a treat that was! Yeah. So on back on with the search. We Back's we need search. we need our next player. I got the I got the last one, so I think it's ball in your court time. Well. As our listeners may have noticed, I'm a Borough fan. I think I've mentioned it. Mm-hmm. I think it's about time we took this back up north, don't you? Yeah. Some smoggies. So, yeah, if you know someone, if your gardener lives next door to someone, if someone's boarded your loft that used to play tennis with their ex-footballer, if Giannino, anything like that. If Janino's paved your drive, get in touch with us because we want to speak to him. If you've got any old stickers from the 1997 book, send us those as well because we've got half-filled mm. books here and we've got a few old stickers that tops have actually sent us and we want to do some swaps again roll back the years uh, do you have any stories about a 90s footballer that we might appreciate tell us them visit our website searchingforchinese.com contact us there or follow us on twitter and instagram and contact us there we are at the shiny pod please subscribe to the podcast on apple spotify acast stitcher we're pretty much everywhere give us a shiny review and a shiny five star rating and tell anyone who loves 90s football that we exist mm, yes let them know however you can That's it for today. Can't wait to see you next week. Thanks, guys.